Chapter Eleven of Poems of American History, Volume Five, The Period of Expansion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. L. Baldwin. Poems of American History, Volume Five, The Period of Expansion, by Various, Section Eleven. For generations, Americans had been taught by the provincially minded to glory in their splendid isolation. But the more discerning perceived that steam and electricity were making the world smaller and smaller, and that economic causes were drawing its nations more and more closely together. They perceived, too, that the democratic theory of government to which America was consecrated had two staunch champions in Western Europe, France and England, and two implacable enemies, Germany and Austria and when, on August 1, 1914, the rulers of these two empires decreed the war which they hoped would lead to world power, many Americans felt most keenly that their country's place was by the side of France and England in their battle for human freedom. Sonnets written in the fall of 1914 Awake, ye nations, slumbering supine, who round and ring the European fray! Heard ye the trumpet sound, the day, the day, the last that shall on England's empire shine? The Parliament that broke the right divine shall see her realm of reason swept away, and lesser nations shall the sword obey. The sword o'er all carve the great world's design. So on the English Channel boasts the foe, on whose imperial brow death's helmet nods. Look where his hosts o'er bloody Belgium go, and nix a nation's past with blazing sods. A kingdom's waste, a people's homeless woe, man's broken word, and violated gods. Far fall the day when England's realm shall see the sunset of dominion. Her increase abolishes the man-dividing seas and frames the brotherhood on earth to be. She, in free peoples planting sovereignty, orbs half the civil world in British peace. And though time dispossess her and she cease, Rome-like she greatens in man's memory. O oh, many a crown shall sink in war's turmoil, and many a new republic light the sky. Fleets sweep the ocean, nations till the soil. Genius be born, and generations die. Orient and Occident together toil, ere such a mighty work man rears on high. Hearken the feet of the destroyer tread the winepress of the nations, fast the blood pours from the side of Europe. In full flood on the septentrional watershed the rivers of fair France are running red. England, the mother airy of our brood, that on the summit of dominion stood, shakes in the blast, heaven battles overhead. Lift up thy head, O reams of ages air that treasured up in thee their glorious sum, upon whose brow prophetically fair flamed the great morrow of the world to come. Haunt with thy beauty this volcanic air, ere yet thou close, O flower of Christendom. As when the shadow of the sun's eclipse sweeps on the earth and spreads a spectral air, as if the universe were dying there, on continent and isle the darkness dips, unwanted gloom, and on the Atlantic slips. So in the night the Belgian cities flare horizon-wide, the wandering people fare along the roads and load the fleeing ships, and westward borne that planetary sweep, darkening o'er England and her times to be, already steps upon the ocean deep. Watch well, my country, that unearthly sea, lest when thou thinkest not, and in thy sleep, unapt for war, that gloom and shadow thee. George Edward Woodbury American opinion was especially aroused by Germany's cynical disregard of her pledge to preserve the neutrality of Belgium, and by the outrages which crimsoned every step of the invasion of that little kingdom. Abraham Lincoln walks at midnight in Springfield, Illinois. It is portentous and a thing of state that here at midnight in our little town a morning figure walks and will not rest near the old courthouse pacing up and down. Or by his homestead or in shadowed yards he lingers where his children used to play. Or through the market on the well-worn stones he stalks until the dawn stars burn away. A bronzed lank man, his suit of ancient black, a famous high top hat and plain worn shawl make him the quaint great figure that men love the prairie lawyer, master of us all. He cannot sleep upon his hillside now. He is among us as in times before. And we who toss and lie awake for long breathe deep and start to see him pass the door. His head is bowed, he thinks on men and kings. Yea, when the sick world cries, how can he sleep? 
too many peasants fight they know not why too many homesteads in black terror weep the sins of all the warlords burn his heart he sees the dreadnoughts scouring every main he carries on his shawl-wrapped shoulders now the bitterness the folly and the pain he cannot rest until a spirit dawn shall come the shining hope of europe free the league of sober folk the workers earth bringing long peace to cornland alp and sea it breaks his heart that kings must murder still that all his hours of travail here for men seem yet in vain and who will bring white peace that he may sleep upon his hill again beshell lindsay on sea as well as on land the same policy of frightfulness was followed and german submarines and raiders finding it dangerous to attack british battleships turned their attention to unarmed merchantmen on february twenty eighth nineteen fifteen an american vessel the william p fry carrying wheat from seattle to queenstown was sunk by a german raider in the south atlantic the william p fry february twenty eighth nineteen fifteen i saw her first abreast the boston light at anchor she had just come in turned head and sent her hawsers creaking clattering down i was so near to where the hawse pipes fed the cable out from her careening bow i moved up on the swell shut steam and lay hove to in my old launch to look at her she'd come in light a skimming up the bay lake a white ghost with topsails bellying full and all her noble lines from bow to stern made music in the wind it seemed she rode the morning air like those thin clouds that turn into tall ships when sunrise lifts the clouds from calm sea courses there in smoke-smudged coats lay funneled liners dirty fishing craft blunt cargo luggers tugs and ferry boats oh it was good in that black scuttled lot to see the fry come lording on her way like some old queen that we had half forgot come to her own a little up the bay the fort lay green for it was springtime then the wind was fresh rich with the spicy bloom of the new england coast that tardily escapes late april from an icy tomb the state house glittered on old beacon hill gold in the sun twas all so fair a while but she was fairest this great square-rigged ship that had blown in from some far happy isle or from the shores of the hesperides they caught her in a south atlantic road becalmed and found her hold brimmed up with wheat wheat's contraband they said and blew her hull to pieces murdered one of our staunch fleet fast dwindling of the big old sailing ships that carry trade for us on the high sea and warped out of each harbor in the states it wasn't law so it seemed strange to me a big mistake her keels struck bottom now and her foremast sunk fathoms fathoms deep to davy jones the dank seaweed will root on her oozed decks and the cross surges sweep through the set sails but never never more her crew will stand away to brace and trim nor sea-blown petrels meet her thrashing up to windward on the gulf stream's stormy rim never again shall head a northeast gale or like a spirit loom up sliding dumb and ride in safe beyond the boston light to make the harbor glad because she's come jean robert foster the crowning outrage came on may seventh nineteen fifteen when the great cunard steamship lusitania was torpedoed without warning off the coast of ireland and one thousand one hundred fifty three men women and children drowned of these one hundred fourteen were americans the white ships and the red may seventh nineteen fifteen with drooping sail and pennant that never a wind may reach they float in sunless waters beside a sunless beach their mighty masts and funnels are white as driven snow and with a pallid radiance their ghostly bulwarks glow here is a spanish galleon that once with gold was gay here is a roman trireme whose hues outshone the day but tyrian dyes have faded and prows that once were bright with rainbow stains were only death's livid dreadful white white as the ice that clove her that unforgotten day among her pallid sisters the grim titanic lay and through the leagues above her she looked aghast and said what is this living ship that comes where every ship is dead the ghostly vessels trembled from ruined stern to prow what was this thing of terror that broke their vigil now down through the startled ocean a mighty vessel came not white as all dead ships must be but red like living flame the pale green waves about her were swiftly strangely dyed by the great scarlet stream that flowed from out her wounded side and all her decks were scarlet and all her shattered crew 
she sank among the white ghost ships and stained them through and through the grim titanic greeted her and who art thou she said why dost thou join our ghostly fleet arrayed in living red we are the ships of sorrow who spend the weary night until the dawn of judgment day obscure and still and white nay said the scarlet visitor though i sink through the sea a ruined thing that was a ship i sink not as did ye for ye met with your destiny by storm or rock or fight so through the lagging centuries ye wear your robes of white but never crashing iceberg nor honest shot of foe nor hidden reef has sent me the way that i must go my wound that stains the waters my blood that is like flame bear witness to a loathly deed a deed without a name i went not forth to battle i carried friendly men the children played about my decks the women sang and then and then the sun blushed scarlet and heaven hid its face the world that god created became a shameful place my wrong cries out for vengeance the blow that sent me here was aimed in hell my dying scream has reached jehovah's ear not all the seven oceans shall wash away that stain upon a brow that wears a crown i am the brand of cain when god's great voice assembles the fleet on judgment day the ghosts of ruined ships will rise in sea and strait and bay though they have lain for ages beneath the changeless flood they shall be white as silver but one shall be like blood. Joyce Kilmer No event since the sinking of the Maine in Havana Harbor had so stirred the country with rage and horror. The contention of the Germans that they were fighting for the freedom of the seas was indignantly scouted. Mare Liberum You dare to say with perjured lips we fight to make the ocean free? You, whose black trail of butchered ships bestrews the bed of every sea where German submarines have wrought their horrors? Have you never thought what you call freedom, men call piracy? Unnumbered ghosts that haunt the wave where you have murdered cry you down, and seamen whom you would not save weave now in weed-grown depths a crown of shame for your imperious head, a dark memorial of the dead, women and children whom you sent to drown, nay, not till thieves are set to guard the gold and corsairs called to keep or peaceful commerce watch and ward, and wolves to herd the helpless sheep shall men and women look to thee thou ruthless old man of the sea to safeguard law and freedom on the deep in nobler breeds we put our trust the nations in whose sacred lore the ought stands out above the must and honour rules in peace and war with these we hold in soul and heart with these we choose our lot and part till liberty is safe on sea and shore henry van dyke President Woodrow Wilson warned Germany that the United States could not stand idly by in the event of further contemptuous disregard of American rights, and Germany promised to restrict her submarine warfare. But a great portion of the country felt there was already more than sufficient cause for war, and many Americans entered the French Aviation Corps and Foreign Legion, or went to Canada and enlisted there, in order to take their stand at once beside the nations which were battling for human liberty ode in memory of the american volunteers fallen for france to have been read before the statue of lafayette in washington in paris on decoration day may thirty nineteen sixteen one ay it is fitting on this holiday commemorative of our soldier dead when with sweet flowers of our new england may hiding the lichened stones by fifty years made gray their graves in every town are garlanded that pious tribute should be given, too, to our intrepid few, obscurely fallen here beyond the seas. Those to preserve their country's greatness died, but by the death of these something that we can look upon with pride has been achieved, nor wholly unreplied can sneers triumph in the charge they make, that from a war where freedom was at stake, America withheld and daunted stood aside. 2. Be they remembered here with each reviving spring, not only that in May, when life is loveliest, around Neville saint vaast and the disputed crest of Vimy, they superb, unfaltering, in that fine onslaught that no fire could halt, parted impetuous to their first assault, but they that brought fresh hearts and spring-like, too, to that high mission, and tis meet to strew with twigs of lilac and spring's earliest rose, the cenotaph of those who in the cause that history most endears fell in the sunny morn and flower of their young years. 3. Yet sought they neither recompense nor praise, nor to be mentioned in another breath, than their blue-coated comrades whose great days it was their pride to share, 
I share even to the death. Nay, rather, France, to you they rendered thanks, seeing they came for honor, not for gain, who, opening to them your glorious ranks, gave them that grand occasion to excel, that chance to live the life most free from stain, and that rare privilege of dying well. 4. O oh, friends, I know not since that war began from which no people nobly stands aloof, if in all moments we have given proof of virtues that were thought American. I know not if in all things done and said all has been well and good, or if each one of us can hold his head as proudly as he should, or from the pattern of those mighty dead whose shades our country venerates today, if we've not somewhat fallen and somewhat gone astray. But you to whom our land's good name is dear, if there be any here who wonder if her manhood be decreased, relaxed its sinews and its blood less red, than at Shiloh and Antietam shed, be proud of these, have joy in this at least, and cry, Now heaven be praised, that in that hour that most imperiled her, menaced her liberty who foremost raised Europe's bright flag of freedom, some there were who, not unmindful of the antique debt, came back the generous path of Lafayette. And when of a most formidable foe she checked each onset, arduous to stem, foiled and frustrated them. On these red fields, where blow with furious blow was countered, whether the gigantic fray rolled by the news or at the bois sabot, accents of ours were in the fierce melee. And on that furthest rim of hallowed ground, where the forlorn, the gallant charge expires, when the slain bugler has long ceased to sound, and on the tangled wires the last wild rally staggers, crumbles, stops, withered beneath the shrapnel's iron showers. Now heaven be thanked we gave a few brave drops, now heaven be thanked a few brave drops were ours. 5. There, holding still in frozen steadfastness, their bayonets toward the beckoning frontiers, they lie, our comrades, lie among their peers, clad in the glory of fallen warriors, grim clusters under thorny trellises, dry, furthest foam upon disastrous shores, leaves that made last year beautiful still strewn even as they fell, unchanged beneath the changing moon. And earth in her divine indifference rolls on, and many paltry things and mean prate to be heard and caper to be seen. But they are silent, calm, their eloquence is that incomparable attitude, no human presences their witness are, but summer clouds and sunset crimson-hued, and showers and night winds and the northern star. Nay, even our salutations seem profane, opposed to their Elysian quietude. Our salutations coming from afar, from our ignobler plain, and undistinction of our lesser parts. Hail, brothers, and farewell. You are twice blessed, brave hearts. Double your glory is who perished thus, for you have died for France and vindicated us. Alan Seeger. Germany lived up to her agreement only in partial and grudging fashion, and the climax came on January 31, 1917, when the German government announced that an unrestricted submarine warfare against all ships encountered on the seas would begin next day. President Wilson at once handed the German ambassador his passports, and on April 2, after the sinking of three American ships without warning, appeared before Congress and asked that war be declared. After thirteen hours of debate, the Senate passed the necessary resolution. The House concurred on April 5, and the next day the President issued a proclamation declaring that a state of war exists between the United States and the Imperial German Government. Republic to Republic, 1776 to 1917 France, it is I answering, America, and it shall be remembered not only in our lips but in our hearts and shall awaken forever familiar and new as the morning that we were the first of all lands to be lovers, to run to each other with the incredible cry of recognition, bound by no ties of nearness or of knowledge, but of the nearness of the heart. You chose me then, and so I choose you now by the same nearness, and the name you called me then I call you now, O Liberty, my love. Witter Binner The Entente powers welcomed their new ally with bursting hearts, for a decisive victory, which was becoming more and more hopeless, now seemed assured. To the United States of America, Brothers in blood, they who this wrong began to wreck our commonwealth will rue the day when first they challenged freemen to the fray, and when the Briton dared the American. Now we are pledged to win the rights of man. 
labor and justice now shall have their way and in a league of peace god grant we may transform the earth not patch up the old plan sure is our hope since he who led your nation spake for mankind and ye arose in awe of that high call to work the world's salvation clearing your minds of all estranging blindness in the vision of beauty and the spirit's law freedom and honor and sweet loving kindness robert bridges one of the first acts of the government was to seize all enemy ships in american ports which of course included hawaii puerto rico and the philippines these were at once overhauled and put into service under american command the captive ships at manila our keels are furred with tropic weed that clogs the crawling tides and scarred with crust of salt and rust that gnaws our idle sides and little junks they come and go and ships they sail at dawn and all the outbound winds that blow they call us to be gone as yearning to the lifting seas our gaunt flotilla rides drifting aimless to and fro sport of every wind a-blow swinging to the ebb and flow of lazy tropic tides and once we knew the clean sea ways to sail them pridefully and once we met the clean sea winds and gave them greeting free and honest craft they spoke us fair who'd scorn to speak us now and little craft they'd not beware to cross a german bow when yet the flag of germany had honor on the sea and now of all that seaward fair what ship of any port is there but would dip her flag to a black corsair ere she'd signal such as we yet we are ribbed with norseland steel and fleshed with viking pine that's fashioned of the soil which bred the hosts of charlemagne and clad we are with rusting pride of stays and links and plates that lay within the mountainside where barbarossa waits the mighty frederick thralled in sleep held by the ancient sign while yet the ravens circle wide above that guarded mountainside full fed with carrion from the tide of swinish red rapine oh we have known the german men when german men were true and we have borne the german flag when honor was her due but sick we are of honest scorn from honest merchantmen the winds they call us to be gone down to the seas again down to the seas where waves lift white and gulls they shear in the blue shriven clean of our blood-bought scorn by a foeman's flag i proudly borne cleaving out in the good red dawn out again to the blue dorothy paul every effort was bent toward getting an army into the field in the shortest possible time general john j pershing was appointed to command the american expeditionary forces and started for france the national guard was mobilized volunteers called for and the first division of regulars was loaded on transports and on june fourteenth headed out to sea the road to france thank god our liberating lance goes flaming on the way to france to france the trail the gurkhas found to france old england's rallying ground to france the path the russians strode to france the anzac's glory road to france where our lost legion ran to fight and die for god and man to france with every race and breed that hates oppression's brutal creed ah france how could our hearts forget the path by which came lafayette how could the haze of doubt hang low upon the road of rochambeau at last thank god at last we see there is no tribal liberty no beacon lighting just our shores no freedom guarding but our doors the flame she kindled for our sires burns now in europe's battle fires the soul that led our fathers west turns back to free the world's oppressed allies you have not called in vain we share your conflict and your pain old glory through new stains and rents partakes of freedom's sacraments into that hell his will creates we drive the foe his lusts his hates last come we will be the last to stay till right has had her crowning day replenish comrades from our veins the blood the sword of despot drains and make our eager sacrifice part of the freely rendered price you pay to lift humanity you pay to make our brothers free see with what proud hearts we advance to france daniel henderson general pershing with his staff reached england early in june and crossed to france a few days later on the fourth of july a parade of american troops took place in paris proceeding to the picpus cemetery where general pershing placed a wreath on the tomb of lafayette legend has it that he said simply lafayette we are here pershing at the tomb of lafayette july fourth nineteen seventeen 
they knew they were fighting our war as the months grew to years their men and their women had watched through their blood and their tears for a sign that we knew we who could not have come to be free without france long ago and at last from the threatening sea the stars of our strength on the eyes of their weariness rose and he stood among them the sorrow-strong hero we chose to carry our flag to the tomb of the frenchman whose name a man of our country could once more pronounce without shame what crown of rich words would he set for all time on this day the past and the future were listening what he would say only this from the white flaming heart of a passion austere only this ah but france understood lafayette we are here amelia josephine burr an army of at least two million men was needed at once to secure it with the least possible disturbance of the country's economic life congress passed a bill providing for a selective draft of all men between twenty-one and thirty great training camps were built and by september the training of the national army was in full swing while the national guard regiments which had already had some training were started on their way to france your lad and my lad down toward the deep blue water marching to throb of drum from city street and country lane the lines of khaki come the rumbling guns the sturdy tread are full of grim appeal while rays of western sunshine flash back from burnished steel with eager eyes and cheeks aflame the serried ranks advance and your dear lad and my dear lad are on their way to france a sob clings choking in the throat as file on file sweep by between those cheering multitudes to where the great ships lie the batteries halt the columns wheel to clear-toned bugle call with shoulders squared and faces front they stand a khaki wall tears shine on every watcher's cheek love speaks in every glance for your dear lad and my dear lad are on their way to france before them through the mist of years in soldier buff or blue brave comrades from a thousand fields watch now in proud review the same old flag the same old faith the freedom of the world spells duty in those flapping folds above long ranks unfurled strong are the hearts which bear along democracy's advance as your dear lad and my dear lad go on their way to france the word rings out a million feet tramp forward on the road along that path of sacrifice o'er which their fathers strode with eager eyes and cheeks aflame with cheers on smiling lips these fighting men of seventeen move onward to their ships nor even love may hold them back or halt that stern advance as your dear lad and my dear lad go on their way to france randall parrish germany had boasted that we could never get an army to europe past her submarines but so efficient was the system of protection worked out by the navy that only one loaded transport was sunk early in february nineteen eighteen the tuscania carrying two thousand one hundred seventy nine american soldiers was torpedoed off the north coast of ireland british destroyers rescued all but about two hundred before the ship sank nearly all the bodies were washed ashore and were tenderly buried a call to arms february five nineteen eighteen it is i america calling above the sound of rivers falling above the whir of the wheels and the chime of the bells in the steeple wheels rolling gold into the palms of the people bells ringing silverly clear and slow to church-going leisurely steps on pavements below above all familiar sounds of the life of a nation i shout to you a name and the flame of that name is sped like fire into hearts where blood runs red the hearts of the land burn hot to the land's salvation as i call across the long miles as i america call to my nation tuscania tuscania americans remember the tuscania shall we not remember how they died in their young courage and loyalty and pride our boys bright-eyed clean lads of america's breed hearts of gold limbs of steel flower of the nation indeed how they toss their years to be into icy waters of a winter sea that we whom they loved that the world which they loved should be free ready ungrudging they died each one thinking likely as the moment was come of the dear starry flag worth dying for and then of dear faces at home going down in good order with a song on their lips of the land of the free and the brave till each young deep voice stopped under the rush of a wave was it like that and shall their memory ever grow pale not ever till the stars and the flag of america fail it is i america who swear it calling over the sound of that deep ocean's falling 
Tuscania, Tuscania, arm, arm, Americans, remember the Tuscania. Very peacefully they are sleeping in friendly earth, unmindful of a nation's weeping. And the kindly strange folk that honored the long full graves we know, and the mothers know that their boys are safe now from the hurts of a savage foe. It is for us who are left to make sure and plain that these dead, our precious dead, shall not have died in vain. So that I, America, young and strong and not afraid, I set my face across that sea which swallowed the bodies of the sons I made. I set my eyes on the still faces of boys washed up on a distant shore, and I call with a shout to my own to end this horror for evermore. In the boys' names I call a name, and the nation leaps to fire in its flame, and my sons and my daughters crowd eager to end the shame. It is I, America, calling, hoarse with the roar of that ocean falling. Tuscania, Tuscania, arm, arm, Americans, and remember, remember the Tuscania. Mary Raymond Shipman Andrews Meanwhile, in France, the Americans were already taking part in the war. About the middle of October, the first division had been sent into a heretofore quiet sector of the trenches beyond Einville in Lorraine. On October 25, we took our first prisoner. A few days later, we had our first wounded. And finally, before dawn on the morning of November 3, came a swift German raid in which three Americans were killed, five wounded and eleven taken prisoner. The three whose names were Corporal James D. Gresham, Private Thomas F. Enright, and Private Merle D. Hay, were buried at Bathlemont next day with touching ceremonies. The First Three, November 3, 1917 Somewhere in France, upon a brown hillside, they lie, the first of our brave soldiers slain. Above them flowers now beaten by the rain, yet emblematic of the youths who died in their fresh promise. They who valiant-eyed met death unfaltering have not fallen in vain. Remembrance hallows those who thus attain the final goal. Their names are glorified. Read then the roster, Gresham, Enright, Hay. No bugle call shall rouse them when the flower of morning breaks above the hills and dells, for they have grown immortal in an hour, and we who grieve and cherish them would lay upon their hillside graves our immortelles. Clinton Scollard to America on her first sons fallen in the Great War. Now you are one with us, you know our tears, those tears of pride and pain so fast to flow. You too have sipped the first strange draught of woe. You too have tasted of our hopes and fears. Sister across the ocean, stretch your hand. Must we not love you more who learn to understand? There are new graves in France, new quiet graves, the first fruit of a nation great and free full of rich fire of life and chivalry. Lie quietly, though tide of battle laves above them. Sister, sister, see our tears. We mourn with you, who know so well the bitter years. Now do you watch with us, your pain of loss lit by a wondrous glow of love and power, that flowers star-like at the darkest hour, lighting the eternal message of the cross. They gain their life who lose it, earth shall rise anew and cleansed because of life's great sacrifice. And that great band of souls your dead have met, who saved the world in centuries past and gone, shall find new comrades in their valiant throng. O oh, nation's heart that cannot e'er forget, is not death but the door to life begun, to those who hear far heaven cry, well done? E. M. Walker Training proceeded rapidly, and the sectors where its final stages took place became more and more lively, as the Americans were gradually given a freer and freer hand. End of section 11. Chapter 11 of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J.L. Baldwin. Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion, by Various, Section 12. Rouge Bouquet, March 7, 1918. In a wood they call the Rouge Bouquet, there is a new-made grave today, built by never a spade nor pick, yet covered with earth ten meters thick. There lie many fighting men, dead in their youthful prime, never to laugh nor love again, nor taste the summertime. 
for death came flying through the air and stopped his flight at the dugout stair touched his prey and left them there clay to clay he hid their bodies stealthily in the soil of the land they fought to free and fled away now over the grave abrupt and clear three volleys ring and perhaps their brave young spirits hear the bugle sing go to sleep go to sleep slumber well where the shells screamed and fell let your rifles rest on the muddy floor you will not need them any more dangers past now at last go to sleep there is on earth no worthier grave to hold the bodies of the brave than this place of pain and pride where they nobly fought and nobly died never fear but in the skies saints and angels stand smiling with their holy eyes on this new-come band st michael's sword darts through the air and touches the oriole on his hair as he sees them stand saluting there his stalwart sons and patrick bridget columkill rejoice that in veins of warriors still the gale's blood runs and up to heaven's doorway floats from the wood called rouge bouquet a delicate cloud of bugle notes that softly say farewell farewell comrades true born anew peace to you your souls shall be where the heroes are and your memory shine like the morning star. Brave and dear, shield us here. Farewell. Joyce Kilmer The great summons came in the spring of 1918, for on March 21 the Germans began a series of terrific attacks which they believed would end the war. On March 31, an official note announced that the Star-Spangled Banner will float beside the French and English flags in the plains of Picardy. On April 17, the order came for the 1st Division to move into the battle area. Marching Song, April 17, 1918 When Pershing's men go marching into Picardy, marching, marching into Picardy, with their steel aslant in the sunlight and their great gray hawks a-wing, and their wagons rumbling after them like thunder in the spring, tramp, 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 till the earth is shaken, tramp, 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 till the dead towns waken, and flowers fall and shouts arise from Chaumont to the sea, when Pershing's men go marching, marching into Picardy. Women of France, do you see them pass to the battle in the north? And do you stand in the doorways now as when your own went forth? Then smile to them and call to them, and mark how brave they fare upon the road to Picardy that only youth may dare. Tramp, 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 foot and horse and caisson. Tramp, 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 such is freedom's passion. And oh, take heart, ye weary souls that stand along the lease, for the new world is marching, marching into Picardy. April's sun is in the sky and April's in the grass, and I doubt not that Pershing's men are singing as they pass, for they are very young men and brave men and free, and they know why they are marching, marching into Picardy. Tramp, 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 rank and file together. Tramp, 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 tramp through the April weather and never spring has thrust such blades against the light of dawn as yonder waving stalks of steel that move so shining on i have seen the wooden crosses at ypres and verdun i have marked the graves of such as lie where the marne waters run and i know their dust is stirring by hill and vale and lee and their souls shall be our captains who march to picardy tramp 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 hope shall fail us never tramp 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 forward and forever and God is in his judgment seat, and Christ is on his tree, and Pershing's men are marching, marching into Picardy. Dana Burnett On June 2, the 2nd and 3rd Divisions met and checked the enemy at Chateau Thierry. The Marne offensive was followed sharply by another on the part of the British, with whom our 27th Division was fighting, and on August 8, the 27th broke through the famous Hindenburg Line. Our Modest Doughboys, August 8, 1918 Said the captain, there was wire a mile deep in no man's land, and the concentrated fire was all mortal nerve could stand. But these huskies craved the chance to go out and leave their bones. The climate's quite some damp in France, said Private Thomas Jones. Said the Major, what is more, at the point where we attacked, tough old veterans loudly swore Hindy's line could not be cracked. But the twenty-seven said, Hindenburg, that guy's a myth. I slept last night in a regular bed, said Private Johnny Smith. Said the Colonel, they had placed pillboxes on the crests. I can safely say we faced maybe thousands of those nests, but our doughboys took one height seven times in that hell's hail. And were the cooties thick? Good night, said Private William Dale. 
said the general, we were told anything we'd start they'd stop, that the Bosch would knock us cold when we slid across the top. But the seventh with a yell made the Prussian guards back down. Ya to lamped the smile on Nell, said Private Henry Brown. Said the sergeant, every shell seemed to whine, old scout, you're dead, and I thought I'd gone to hell in a blizzard of hot lead. But each bloomin' gunner stuck at his post by his machine. Our order said to hold it, Buck, said Private Peter Green. Said the chaplain, talk of pep, they were there, and may I add, when we clambered up the step that last fight, we only had eighty men of Company D, every one I'll say a man. And am I glad I'm home? Ah, we, said Private Mike McCann. Charlton Andrews. Early in September, eight American divisions were concentrated on the Lorraine front and organized into the first American army. On September 12, an assault in force was made against the saint Miel salient, which had threatened France for four years. Twenty-four hours later, the salient was ours, together with 15,000 prisoners. Seichpré, September 12, 1918 A handful came to Seichpré when winter woods were bare, when ice was in the trenches and snow was in the air. The foe looked down on Seichpré and laughed to see them there. The months crept by at Seichpré. The growing handful stayed, with growling guns at midnight, at dawn the lightning raid, and learned in Seichpré trenches how a war's red game is played. September came to Seichpré. A slow-wrought host arose, and rolled across the trenches, and whelmed its sneering foes, and left to shattered Seichpré, unending sweet repose. Two weeks later we began our greatest battle in an attack on the strong German positions running from the Meuse westward through the Argonne Forest. It was in this battle that perhaps the most remarkable single exploit of the war was performed, when Corporal Alvin C. York, a young giant from the mountains of Tennessee, who had been sent forward with a small squad to clean up some machine-gun nests, killed single-handed twenty-eight Germans and came back with 132 prisoners. A Ballad of Redhead's Day October 8, 1918 Talk of the Greeks at Thermopylae, they fought like mad till the last was dead. But Alvin C. York of Tennessee stayed cool to the end though his hair was red, stayed mountain cool, yet blazed that gray October the 8th as Redhead's Day. With rifle and pistol and redhead nerve he captured 132, a battalion against him he did not swerve from the titan's task they were sent to do. Fourteen men under Sergeant Early and York the blacksmith, big and burly. Sixteen only, but fighters all, they dared the brood of a devil's nest, and three of those that did not fall were wounded and out of the scrap, the rest were guarding a bunch of Bosch they'd caught, when both were trapped by a fresh onslaught. Excepting York, who smiled amen, and spotting the nests of spitting guns, potted some twenty birds, and then did with his pistol for eight more Huns, who thought they could crush a Yankee alive in each red pound of two hundred and five. That was enough for kill babe Fritz. Ninety and all threw up their hands, suddenly tender as lamb at the Ritz, milder than sheep to a York's commands, and back to his line he drove the herd, gathering more on the way, absurd. Absurd but true, I gospel fact, for here was a man with a level head, who scorning to fail for the help he lacked, helped himself till he won instead. An elder was he in the Church of Christ, immortal at thirty, his faith sufficed. Richard Butler Glenzer While our Argonne offensive was in progress, the French and English had been striking mighty blows at other portions of the German line, and everywhere the enemy was in retreat. Realizing that their power was broken, and to save themselves from imminent disaster, the Germans asked for an armistice. It was offered on terms so drastic that many thought the Germans would not sign, but they did and at eleven o'clock on the morning of November 11, 1918, firing ceased all along the front. Victory Bells I heard the bells across the trees, I heard them ride the plunging breeze above the roofs from tower and spire, and they were leaping like a fire, and they were shining like a stream with sun to make its muscle gleam. Deep tones as though the thunder told, cool voices thin as tinkling gold, they shook the spangled autumn down from out the treetops of the town. They left great furrows in the air and made a clangor everywhere, as of metallic wings. They flew aloft in spirals to the blue tall tent of heaven and disappeared. And others, swift as though they feared the people might not heed their cry, went shouting victory up the sky. 
they did not say that war is done only that glory has begun like sunrise and the coming day will burn the clouds of war away there will be time for dreams again and homecoming for weary men grace hazard conkling america had lost nearly fifty thousand men killed in battle and immediately after the armistice work was begun gathering together their bodies scattered over many battlefields and reinterring them in beautiful cemeteries where their graves would be perpetually cared for and honored Apicidium, in memory of america's dead in the great war no more for them shall evening's rose unclose nor dawn's emblazoned panoplies be spread alike the rain's warm kiss and stabbing snows unminded fall upon each hallowed head but the bugles as they leap and wildly sing rejoice remembering the guns mad music their young years have known war's lullabies that moaned on flanders plain to-night the wind walks on them still as stone where they lie huddled close as riven grain but the drums reverberating proudly roll they love a soldier's soul with arms outflung and eyes that laughed at death they drank the wine of sacrifice and loss for them a lifetime spanned a burning breath and truth they visioned clean of earthly dross but the fifes can ye not hear their lusty shriek they know and now they speak the lazy drift of cloud, the noonday hum of vagrant bees, the lark's untrammeled song shall gladden them no more, who now lie dumb in death's strange sleep, yet once were swift and strong. But the bells that to all living listeners peal, with joy their deeds reveal. They have given their lives with bodies bruised and broken, upon their country's altar they have bled. They have left as priceless heritage a token that honor lives forever with the dead and the bugles as their rich notes rise and fall they answer knowing all j corson miller the dead think you the dead are lonely in that place they are companioned by the leaves and grass by many a beautiful and vanished face by all the strange and lovely things that pass sunsets and dawnings and the starry vast the swinging moon the tracery of trees these they shall know more perfectly at last they shall be intimate with such as these tis only for the living beauty dies fades and drifts from us with too brief a grace beyond the changing tapestry of skies where dwells her perfect and immortal face for us the passage brief the happy dead are ever by great beauty visited david morton the unreturning for us the dead though young for us who fought and bled let a last song be sung and a last word be said dreams hopes and high desires that leaven and uplift on sacrificial fires we offered as a gift we gave and gave our all in gladness though in pain let not a whisper fall that we have died in vain clinton scholard to america's soldier dead was added on january sixth nineteen nineteen a valiant and righteous warrior theodore roosevelt whose sudden death at the age of sixty one was a shock to the whole country the star january sixth nineteen nineteen great soul to all brave souls akin high bearer of the torch of truth have you not gone to marshal in those eager hosts of youth flung outward by the battle's tide they met in regions dim and far and you in whom youth never died shall lead them as a star marion kutoy smith arrangements for sending home the american army were begun immediately after the armistice and within a few months a steady stream of khaki-clad troops was flowing through the port of brest bound for america rest left behind the sun strikes gold the dirty street the band blares the drums insist and brown legs twinkle and muscles twist pound pound the rhythmic feet the laughing street boys shout and a couple of hags come out to grin and bob and clap stiff rusty black their dresses and crispy white their breton cap prim on white smooth tresses wait wait while dun clouds droop over the sunlit docks over the wet gray rocks and mast of steamer and sloop and the old squat towers damp gray and mossy brown where lovely anne looked down and dreamed rich dreams through long luxurious hours sudden and swift it rains familiar fogging gray it blots the sky away and cuts the face with biting little pains we grunt and poke shoes free of muddy cakes watching them messing out upon the dock in thick brown lakes no more french mud the sergeant cries and someone swears and someone sighs and the neat squads swing about silent the looming hulk above no camouflage this time she's white and tan and black 
Hurry, bend, climb, push forward, stagger back. How clean the wide deck seems, the bunks how trim, and oh, the musty smell of ships. Faces are set and grin. Thinking of months, this hope was pain, and eyes are full of dreams, and gay little tunes come springing to the lips. Home, home, again, again. She's moving now. Across the prow, the dusk-soft harbor bursts into a shivering bloom of light from warehouse, warship, transport, tramp, and countless little bobbing masts each flouts the night with eager boastful lamp bright now now dimmer dimmer fewer and fewer glimmer only the lights that mark the passing shore lofty and lonely star the gray then are no more we are alone with dusk and creamy spray the captain coughs remembering the rain the major coughs remembering the mud some shudder at the horror of dark blood or wine-wet kisses lewd some sigh remembering new loves and farewell pain some smile remembering old loves to be renewed silent we stare across the deepening night france vanishing swift swift the curling waves fights in despair and faces fair proud heads held high for victory and flags above friends graves the group buzzes rustles hums then stiffens as the colonel comes a burly figure in the mellow light with haughty kingly ways he does not scan the night nor hissing spray that flies but his cold old glance plays along the level of our eyes i don't see very many tears he says john chipman farrar america went wild in welcoming them as they arrived division after division there were parades and celebrations but with surprising swiftness the divisions were demobilized and the men returned to civil life to the returning brave Victorious knights without reproach or fear, as close as man is ever to the stars, our welcome met you on the ocean drear in loud free winds and sunset's golden bars. Here at our bannered gate, love, honor, laurels wait. Though you be humble, we are proud, and in your stead elate. Fame shall not tire to tell, no sordid stain lies on your purpose, on your record none. No broken word, no violated fane, no winning one could wish had ne'er been won. You were our message sent to the torn continent, that with its hope and faith henceforth our hope and faith are blent. You of our new, our homespun chivalry, here is your welcome in all women's eyes, the envious hand-clasp, romping children's glee, music and color and glad tears that rise. Here every voice of peace shall brute our joy, nor cease to vie with shotless guns to shout your blameless victories. But though you are a part of all men's pride, and from your fortitude new nations date, oh, lay not yet your sacred steel aside, but save it for the still imperiled state. You who have bound a girth of new hope round the earth, should its firm bond be loosened here, what were your struggle worth? A redder peril dogs the paths of war, with fire and poison wanton children play, and fickle crowds toward new pretenders pour, who summon demons they can never lay. Already we can hear, importunately near, the snarling of the savage crew, half fury and half jeer. Then hang not up your arms till you have taught the ungraceful guests about our hearth and board, that in your swift encounter has been wrought a keener edge to our reluctant sword. You who know well the price of the great sacrifice, your courage saved us once, pray heaven it need not save us twice. And those who come not back, who mutely lie by Maun or Meuse or tangled Argon wood, were it to lose the gain, let them reply, would we recall their spirits if we could? Open your ranks and save their places with the brave, that liberty may greet you all, her shields of land and wave. Robert Underwood Johnson Amid all the celebrations there was always the consciousness of those who would not return, in body at least, but whose spirits would never be severed from America's. The Return Golden through the golden morning, who is this that comes, with the pride of banners lifted, with the roll of drums? With the selfsame triumph shining in the ardent glance, that divine bright fate defiance that you bore to France. You, but o'er your grave in Flanders blow the winter gales, still for sorrow of your going all life's laughter fails. Born on flutes of dawn the answer, o'er the foam's white track, God's work done, so to our homeland comes her hosting back come the dead men with the live men from the marshes far from the mounds in no man's valley lit by cross nor star come to blend with hers the essence of their strength and pride all the radiance of the dreaming for whose truth they died 
so the dead men with the live men pass and hosting fair, and the stone is rolled forever from the soul's despair. Eleanor Rogers Cox One distinguished visitor was welcomed by the American people as they welcomed their own sons, King Albert of Belgium, who made an extensive tour of the United States in the summer of 1919. King of the Belgians How spoke the king in his crucial hour victorious? The words of a high decision, few but glorious. What was the choice he made that all fear surmounted? The choice of a man that leaves not the soul uncounted. What did the king in bitter defeat and sorrow? He stood as a god foreseeing a great tomorrow. How fought the king in silent and stern persistence, patience and power within and hope in the distance? What was the gift he won in the fire that tried him? The deathless love of his own who fought beside him. What is his crown, the noblest of all for wearing? The homage of hearts that beat for his splendid bearing. Robe and scepter and crown, what are these for holding? Vesture and sign for his spirit's royal molding. What speaks he now, in the hour of faith victorious? Words of a quiet gladness, few but glorious. Then as we greet him, what shall be ours to render? Silence that shines, and speech that is proud and tender. Marion Cotoy Smith Meanwhile, at Paris, the peace conference under the leadership of President Woodrow Wilson, who had broken all precedents by going to Europe, was struggling with the peace treaty. For America, the great conflict had been a war to end war, and the President insisted that provisions to establish a League of Nations should be made an integral part of the treaty. The Family of Nations With that pathetic impudence of youth, America, half-formed, gigantic, and uncouth, stretching great limbs in something of surprise, beholds new meaning written on the skies. Out of the granite time has reared a state haughty and fearless, awkward, passionate, for all his dreaming and his reckless boast betrayed by those whom he has trusted most. Years of stern peril knit that welded frame, banded those arms and set that heart aflame, burdened those loins with vigor of increase, gave to his hand a weapon forged to peace. He cannot turn the discovering hour aside, he feels the stir that will not be denied, and in the family the nation's plan forgets the boy and finds himself a man. Willard Waddles After months of struggle and negotiation, this purpose was achieved, and on July 10, 1919, the President laid the treaty before the Senate for confirmation. Strong opposition to the League of Nations developed immediately, on the ground that it interfered with America's independence and freedom of action, and various reservations were proposed, limiting America's participation. These the President refused to accept, and finally, after eight months of bitter debate, largely partisan and personal, the Senate rejected the treaty March 19, 1920. The League of Nations Lo, Joseph dreams his dream again, and Joan leads her armies in the night, and somewhere near the Master from his cross lifts his hurt hands and heals the world again. For from the great red welter of the world, out from the tides of its red suffering, comes the slow sunrise of the ancient dream, is flung the glory of its bright imagining. See how it breaks in beauty on the world, shivers and shudders on its trembling way, shivers and waits and trembles to be born. America, young daughter of the gods, swing out, strong in the beauty of virginity, fearless in thine unquestioned leadership and hold the taper to the nation's torch, and light the hearth-fires of the halls of home. Thine must it be to break an unpaved way, to lift the torch for worlds in brothering, to bring to birth this child of all the earth, formed of the marriage of all nations. Else shall we go, the head upon the breast, a Cain without a country, a Judas at the board. Mary Segrist Beyond Wars, for the League of Nations then will a quiet gather round the door and settle on those evening fields again, where women watch the slow homecoming men across brown acres hoofed and hurt no more. The sound of children's feet be on the floor, when lamps are lit and stillness deeper falls, unbroken save where cattle in their stalls keep munching patiently upon their store. Only a scar beside the pasture gate, a torn and naked tree upon the hill, what times remembered will remind them still of long disastrous days they knew of late, till these two yield for sweet accustomed things, and a man ploughs, a woman sows and sings. David Morton It was a revival of the old idea of splendid isolation on the part of men whose gaze was backward and who had learned nothing from the war. 
To all others, however, it is evident that America must take her place with the other peoples of the earth at the council table of the League of Nations, and do her part toward the establishment of peace and liberty throughout the world. WHEN THERE IS PEACE When there is peace, our land no more will be the land we knew of yore. Thus do our facile seers foretell the truth that none can buy or sell, and e'en the wisest must ignore. When we have bled at every pore, shall we strive for gear and store? Will it be heaven, will it be hell, when there is peace? This let us pray, for this implore, that all bay streams thrust out at door, we may in loftier aims excel, and like men waking from a spell, grow stronger nobler than before, when there is peace. Austin Dobson After the War After the war, I hear men ask, what then? As though this rock-ribbed world, sculptured with fire, and bastioned deep in the ethereal plan, can never be its morning self again because of this brief madness man with man. As though the laughing elements should tire, the very seasons in their order reel. As though indeed yon ghostly golden wheel of stars should cease from turning, or the moon befriend the night no more, or the wild rose forget the world and June be no more June. How many wars and long-forgotten woes, unnumbered, nameless, made alike despair in hearts long stilled? How many suns have set on burning cities blackening the air, Yet dawn came dreaming back, her lashes wet with dew, and daisies in her innocent hair. Nor shall for this the soul's ascension pause, nor the sure evolution of the laws that out of foulness lift the flower to the sun, and out of fury forge the evening star. Deem not love's building of the world undone. Far love's beginning was, her end is far. By paths of fire and blood her feet must climb, seeking a loveliness she scarcely knows, whose meaning is beyond the reach of time. Richard Le Gallienne. End of section 12. Recording by J.L. Baldwin. End of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion, by Various.